everybody. I hope everybody's got a wonderful Fane Boss Herbal Cocktail. Because they are pretty special tonight. Uh, Costa and I have been cooking this up for a few months, I think. And I'd actually like to thank him for the invite. And I'd like to thank the Orbit as well for welcoming me into this wonderful space. It's the very first time I'm actually giving a public talk in Joburg. So I'm extremely excited. And thank you so much for making time tonight. We've got quite a few surprises, so I'm going to try and make it as interactive as possible and hopefully tell you some interesting things about plants, including those ones that are going to arouse you. That was part of the intro, right? Okay, bulbine. So take a note if you have a problem with those issues. That's a good one to use. So tonight I will share with you medicinal plants of South Africa, how people use them. I'll talk a little bit about indigenous knowledge. And then I'll also highlight some of the work that we actually do at Stellenbosch as part of my group. So I've tried to keep it with a little bit mixing of fun and fabulous because I actually happen to be a Leo and that's how Leos are. And so please feel free to tweet. And if you want to mention me, I'm at Knox the Lion. And if you want to mention the Orbit, they're at Orbit Jazz. And please hashtag science and cocktails, because that's what this evening is actually all about. Yes? Okay, so if you are having a cocktail, and you have a gin-based cocktail, then you have some of this that I have in this little uh, glass. And anybody know what that could be? The very essence of gin. Yes. Juniper. Yeah, absolutely. So if you've never tried junipers, there are a few here to go around. Try some and see if you can actually get the essence of gin out of this. But yes, juniper extract, fabulous diuretic if you want to fit into a tiny little dress. So just remember that, ladies. But not so much gin, yeah? Okay. So that's what we're going to be talking about today, our medicinal plants. And I'm at Stellenbosch, so I literally stepped out of that beautiful city. And right over there, we've got Table Mountain. Iconic photo of Table Mountain. And ladies and gentlemen, there are more plants on Table Mountain than there are in the whole of the entire UK in terms of species biodiversity. Now, that is something pretty special. Yeah, woohoo, indeed. I would be clapping for that. More plants... <laughs> in terms of species diversity in the whole of the entire UK. They've got wonderful scraggly things like Arabidopsis, but, you know, we've got wonderful things that are beautiful, like this protea that I've actually got on here. Thanks, Sybil, very much for my accessory tonight. And so... I basically came through from Stellenbosch, and I'll talk a little bit about the work we've been doing in this little zone here. I'm just placing us. Just think about it. Paul is somewhere over there. Stellenbosch is over there. Somerset West is probably somewhere round about over there. And I'll talk about that later. And that's my campus if you've never, ever seen it. Sometimes we have this wonderful view, our library right there at the bottom. And that's where some of the magic that I'm talking about tonight actually happens. And yes... The king protea, South Africa's um, national flower. We even have a whole entire set of teams named after this. And this is a defining flower of the Cape Floral region. And that region is one of six biodiversity hotspots, major biodiversity hotspots. And this Cape Floral region, where this protea actually comes from, is the only biodiversity hotspot that is not found in a tropical area. That's quite significant. The Cape Floral region is a Mediterranean climate, and we have this incredible flora that actually comes from there. And well, yeah, 
very special, a concentration of plant endemism. None of these, some of these plants aren't found anywhere else, such as ericas, restios. But Africa as a whole is actually pretty special. And I get really, really excited about this because over 80% of all the plants in Africa are not found anywhere else. We are sitting on a wonderful botanical gold mine. It's an extremely important botanical resource, and some people regard it as a womb of evolution. And what's quite interesting is that this is similar to other parts of the world, China, Mexico, Colombia, New Guinea, Venezuela, and if you look at all these different places, they all have really high levels of speciation. And in those places, people utilize the plants that are there for health and a variety of different things. And they exploit those plants because they have medicinal value. And what do we really mean by medicinal value? Well, these plants are able to synthesize a suite of wonderful and complex compounds which they do not need for their primary growth. They don't need it for primary growth and development. But these secondary metabolites, that's what they used to be called, but now we now call them special metabolites, are very intricate, pretty special, complicated biochemical pathways, and they allow the plant to be able to compete and survive. So they might not be essential for growth, but they are certainly very important for communication. They're very important for fighting biological warfare. The plant is stuck there all the time. Everything else is going at it. Bacteria, viruses, nematodes, all kinds of things. And it has to have a defense system. And that is what we exploit. And this has been exploited for generations upon generations by many, many people in various places of the world where biodiversity is rich. And this is now bringing us to this wonderful system. If you think about it, we have a unique special flora, but we have also unique special people in Southern Africa and also the whole of Africa. South Africa is pretty interesting because, yes, I'm Kosa, but apparently if you trace my surname, Makonga, it actually came all the way from up there, the Bantus, who traced their way all the way down in the southern parts of Africa and had wonderful intermingling with the Khoi and the San, who are the original people of this, of this southern part of Africa. But also we've had lots of people from all over the world who've actually come past our shores. And this has created a very, very unique ethnopharmacopoeia, which we, as people that are interested in the use of plants by people and potential chemistry that people are exploiting for health, actually exploit. So it's a wonderful tapestry to actually work. And that picture over there, I'm sure most of us have actually seen it right over there. Uh, these are ancient, actually pretty old Cape Dutch remedies. So when the Dutch actually arrived here, they found weird, wonderful things, Feinbos, stuff that they've actually never really seen before, such as this. Anybody know what this is? It's in those cocktails. Rooibos. So this is what rooibos actually looks like. Um, before it gets fermented. It's nice and green. And so this has really created a wonderful system of the use of plants. And when we think about plant use, we think about the physical being, but also the spiritual being. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, absolutely, because that spirituality is very important for healing. People often ask me and say, do these plants really have active chemicals that are important? I said, well, actually, you know that they've shown that even if they tell you that this is placebo and you're sick, you will actually get better, yeah, or feel better. And some of the communities that I actually work with, the Rastafarian Cape Bush Herbalists, 
they believe that part of healing is actually an internalization and strengthening of the mind and the body, and all of this then works all together. But hey, when you go to the Western doctor, that guy or that lady doesn't have a lot of time. They've got 10 to 15 minutes because this medical aid is not going to pay for an extra five minutes. So they will not burn this stuff in Beipo, which is actually an incense, which grows here in South Africa and grows in Eastern Africa and other parts of Africa to try and relax you, and which the Sangomas utilize all the time as a way of calming their patient. And incenses have actually been shown to clear out bacteria that happens to be in the air. Okay, so in South Africa, you have an interaction of rural systems and urban system. It's all really mixed up, and much of this knowledge actually follows people into urban centers. And so in these urban centers, you have informal trade of medicinal plants, as well as formalization um, of this phytopharmaceutical industry. So just a look at some of these plants, wild ginger, virtually extinct in the wild because it's been harvested almost to extinction, I think probably to extinction in KwaZulu-Natal, and now collection of wild ginger or isipeto in Zulu is going from Mozambique all the way through into South Africa and feeding these large formal markets that serve a lot of people. So we have some problems associated with the use of plants. So I'm going to go through these slides pretty quickly. So if you've ever walked around Peter Maritzburg, in certain parts of Peter Maritzburg, you will find ladies more especially selling medicinal plants. And all of this has actually come from the wild. And people utilize these plants for health. So those are bundles of impepo, and this is known as curry bush. And if you smell it and you crush the leaves, I am able to pick out a lot of that curry essence out of those plants. That's a picture taken from Nongoma, probably the largest um, uh, market in, in Zululand. Most of the plants are collected from all over South Africa. Some parts, some plants are coming from other parts of Africa, and this large market is almost a central repository, and all these plants in, are distributed into other parts, of Af in other parts of South Africa. And this informal trade of plants services a lot of people. They say about between 60 and 80 percent of our population uses medicinal plants. Many collectors are collecting. These collectors sell to traders, and traders sell to a variety of different customers. And it's a very important economy that is somehow underground and has been underground for many, for many, many, many centuries, or actually many, many years. So more scenes, pretty informal, lots of people being serviced, through this health system, 27 million users. That's a lot of people. And if you go to Cape Town, you meet a different kind of trader, different type of herbalist. You meet a man. And that man is a Cape Bush doctor. Kapse Bossi doctor. You will often see these guys, Rastafarian herbalists, who claim their koi and san heritage, often coming from economies and backgrounds that are impoverished. And they reach out into this ancient system of healing because it connects them to who they feel they really, really are. They take their job extremely seriously, 
and they sell plants in the parade in Cape Town, and they will often carry bundles of medicinal herbs. And the sucker man or the sackcloth man believe that they do away with Babylon, all things Western, and really try and connect to their history, which is linked to the nomadic ways in which the Khoi, Khoi, and the San people actually roamed around Southern Africa. So this herbal system that we have here is pretty different from other parts of the world. It's an oral transmission, oral communication through oral histories. Yeah, we like to sing and talk and pass this message on in different ways. And if you look at Chinese traditional medicine, that is written. So there is a possibility that this knowledge might become lost and that it is continuously changing, and we know that it is. And this is one of the things that we do in my environment, is to actually monitor some of these changes that are taking place in African traditional medicines. And for a very long time, the use of these herbs and the use of this health system was actually banned by the South African government. So in China, written system, and I was quite surprised, I was in China a, a few months ago at a conference, a nice recipe, old ancient Chinese recipe in Chinese characters, and suddenly I see Hopogophytum procumbens, devil's claw. That, plant, that particular species is found in the Northern Cape and also in, in Namibia, and it has been incorporated into Chinese traditional medicine from long ago. So what we do in our environment is really try and understand the dynamics of how the trade of plants actually takes place. So we talk to herbalists and talk to healers and we engage them in our research projects and they become part of the research system. And we do three different things. The recording, we study the specialized metabolism, which makes medicinal plants effective, and we also utilize conservation as a means of cultivation because much of this actually comes from the wild. So we are able to then grow plants and plant parts. I'll pass that along in cell culture, and that is one system in which we actually conserve these plants. And I really love this particular slide, because this slide shows Ua Mian Orch talking to his granddaughter, and you can see how much she's actually listening. And I'm thinking it's a good thing to be listening, because this is a message that you really should be carrying on and holding on to, as Womian Orch is one of the last remaining uh, true uh, uh, Bushmen. And the herbalists that I've been working with, the Cape Bush Doctor Society, have actually recorded um, his knowledge as part of a bigger project, which I'll talk about a bit, a bit later. So why do medicinal plants work? Well, we think it's the chemicals, and that's basically what I study and a whole suite of other scientists actually out there study. And when you look at this, you can see that there's been a positive move in South Africa to concentrate in terms of our flora. We have about 4,000 species or so that are used by people, and we have a lot of work to catch up on because this system used to um, actually be outlawed. So the South African government, since the mid-1990s, has actually been pumping money, and this has led to an explosion of papers in a variety of different journals. And that pattern of studying these plants, trying to understand why they work, reflects a global movement 
in terms of natural product science. So there we are in the green, and you can see we're going up. And if you look at other bricks, they're also part of the system of actually trying to understand how their plants actually function and how they work. What is interesting, though, is that if you take a look at this data, you might not be able to see this very well. Globally, it's biochemistry, genetics, molecular biology. That's what the world is focusing on. South Africans, on the other hand, are focusing on validating whether these plants work or not. So we need to target slightly different areas of research, which then leads me to the new frontiers which we need to explore in terms of medicinal plants. So we spend a lot of time talking to different communities and understanding how people utilize plants and recording the key species that might be important and tracking which plants are being used. And last year when we were on this field trip, suddenly Balbanella, the one that's really good if you have men's issues, came up as one species that we need to start thinking about and conserving. And the reason we think this may be happening is that the incident of diabetes is increasing in rural communities as they become more Babylon, if I can use that term. And this is leading to problems that are associated with men's health, in those particular communities. So Roy Wortel or Balbine is now being utilized to assist with those particular issues. And my students, my male students tell me that it works because they tried it. Okay. All right, so we work on another uh, set of plants and here I'm gonna give some highlights Remember, I can't cover all 5,000 species. I don't have the time. But I'm going to give some highlights. One of the ones that we work on is Sutherlandia fructensis, or cancer bush, cankerbos. And this species grows widely in South Africa, distributed very wildly, widely in the Cape, in the Northern Cape, and also other parts uh, of South Africa. And during the garlic and beetroot era, do we still remember that? Yeah. People were actually using Sutherlandia to uh, boost their immune systems. And recent research has actually shown a negative interaction between Sutherlandia frutescens and antiretroviral drugs. Some of the work that we've been doing in our labs has actually illustrated uh, negative interactions and a great deal of cytotoxicity and cardiotoxicity, so problems with the heart. If you take products such as this continuously for e extended periods of time. So plants are effective, but plants can also be toxic. So we use a suite of different approaches Genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, metabolomics, all just called omics. And what they allow you to do is to be able to see the system or to be able to see part of the system. And we take this complex suite of data and we utilize statistics to try and understand what it means. So, for instance, if we take an example here, this is a whole entire system. And if I say, we're going to profile all the people here, we measure everybody in terms of height, and then we use statistics to say all the shorties go to that side of the corner, and they all end up there. All the ones that are taller than me go to the middle, they all end up there. And all the ones that are extremely tall end up on that side. So we can actually make these groupings if we apply systems biology. And that's some of the data that I'm actually going to share. So the plants that we work on are found all over. We concentrate on these particular chemicals because these are the ones that we think are important and give cancer bush 
that name. We think these are the ones that are important for cancer. And when we collect from various places all over South Africa, and we do this looking at the system, and then we split it out with the statistics, we can actually group out all of these different plants according to where they actually came from. So the chemicals say to us, these plants were actually grown and collected in the Karoo. And these Karoo plants are known to be the ones that are actually highly effective. And this information is quite important because farmers all over South Africa will provide their plant material to various different people that make the products. And this whole pool of stuff comes into one batch, and then it creates a suite of chemistry which becomes extremely complex. So those farmers that are actually in Hans Bai, so those guys over there, when they bring their material, ooh, I like it, liquid, nitrogen. What do we have? Okay. So, I hope you guys are getting some of these delicious, wonderful cocktails. So, those farmers that are in Hans Bay, they actually don't have this um, particular chemical, which is actually monitored. So, when the farmer in Hans Bay comes along and says, here are my plants, the pharmaceutical or phytopharmaceutical manufacturer goes, I actually really don't want them because we don't think they have the right stuff. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. So it can be a problem. We are also able to study drought and able to study um, effects in terms of climate. And drought in Sutherlandia, let's take a little sip here. Can I get right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yummy. Drought in Sutherlandia actually changes not only the specialized metabolites, but also the amino acids. Remember that Sutherlandia is utilized to boost the immune system, and we think it's those amino acids that are important. So if there are differences in the amino acid profile, this means that the efficacy in the body might also change. So that's also another problem. Whew. Okay, so now I'm going to move tack and talk about another strategy that we use to study specialized metabolism, yeah? We sometimes make GMOs, yeah? And the reason we do this is because we can take a gene from one plant that is able to increase metabolism from one plant and put it into another plant and then we try and see what does this gene actually do? Yeah? And this allows us to be able to learn a lot more about how plants actually manufacture secondary metabolites. So we are able to make a whole bunch of these things, different clones, they all kind of look different. And then we use chemistry again to look at the system, and then it tells us something. And here, it's very difficult to see what's actually going on there because you've got all bars that are going up and down like this. But if you take a really, really close look, you will actually see that if we do this funky creating of genomics and genetically varied material, we are able to alter the pathways that actually synthesize these chemicals. So Sutherlandia makes Sutherlandia sites, and through this system, we can actually alter it to make another suite of chemicals which are also of great commercial importance. So that's just a fun thing that we like to do, and it actually does take quite a lot of time. It's not like magic, um, and all of those things are really contained because we're not really wanting to put those GMOs out um, into, into nature, but we use it as a way to study specialized metabolism. Okay, yeah, I think a little bit of buhu at this time, so we can open up that packet. And if 
I think I might be have. Is this is a wilderer in here? Wilderer gin, fan boss gin, because that particular gin has got a wonderful suite of things. It has got. Yeah, I think it's a bit of a break. It has got things like rooibos. It's got things like buhu, which I'm passing around. It's also got uh, things like skeletium. I'm going to talk about this one a bit later. I'm sure you're going to enjoy it. And it's got all sorts of other wonderful and interesting medicinal plants. And I think it's wonderful that we've got this booming industry because people are actually using this flora and creating new economies and actually creating jobs. And this is happening locally. And now I want to talk about something that is very, very exciting for our labs. I do this in collaboration with other people who are in physiology. And this project is really, really dear to my heart because the Rastafarian herbalists came to us and they said, we think we've come onto something pretty special. We include this plant to strengthen the body and we think it's very important in fighting a variety of different illnesses, including breast cancer. And so we said, okay, guys, thank you very much for bringing this to our attention. Let's test. And then when we tested it, it was wonderful to see that the breast cancer cells don't like it very much. They don't like the extract. Green bars are the extract. And the pink bar actually happens to be a chemotherapy known as doxorubicin, which is used to treat um, breast cancer. Green bars, much more effective at particular doses, much better than what's actually out there in the market. The rusters are really onto something here. And then, I'm just going to go back. If we look to see how badly this might create cancers, because all cancer chemotherapy is actually toxic to the cell, the effects are very similar to what is accepted by the pharmaceutical industry. So, our extract really, really works. And then the physiologists, I don't do this, I'm a botanist, the physiologists unfortunately give it, use an animal model, and they create the cancer in the mouse, and then they monitor the size of those tumors, and the extract is effective. But what was really magic, I said the rusters are really onto something here, is that the mice that were treated with the extract did not lose their hair, did not lose weight. Instead, they actually remained healthy. There's something in that extract that really strengthens the body whilst killing the cancer. And so the rusters say to me, Knox, you know what? We only collect from Stellenbosch Mountain. I said, guys, okay, now this is starting to sound a little bit strange. And they say, you've got to walk all the way up, and we are guided to the top of this mountain, and you look at the pyramid of the mountain because it actually guides you to where these plants actually are the most effective plants. And I said, okay, guys, we'll take a look. My little snapshot looked at the chemistry. And what was really interesting is that the plants that are growing on different parts of the same slope of the mountain have different chemistry. My rusters are onto something. And that indigenous knowledge, that intuition, is really special because we can utilize some sophisticated metabolomics strategies to be able to show what the rusters feel and understand. Right? And so this is pretty interesting because I said Stellenbosch is potent. When we looked at all these other places, De Whoop, Cedarburg, De Whoop in the sea, Cedarburg in the mountains, yep, Stellenbosch is better. And then we said, okay, does it really work or does it just kill everything? 
and we can show that, no, it kills the cancer cells and causes the cancer cells to actually die. We have to do this because otherwise we can't um, get this out into the market and commercialize it together with the Bush doctors. These guys, when they saw this set of data, Lennox and Cora, who managed this project, said, can we put a bottle on this thing right now? I said, guys, we have to go more and understand it more. Because that is one of the regulations of the MCC. They require you to be able to provide in vitro, in vivo, and ultimately evidence showing that it actually works in the human body. So from the bottle and into the animal and hopefully in a clinical trial system. So it takes a long time. Okay, so... Again, when we look, remember what I said to you right at the beginning, I actually stay in Stellenbosch and work in Stellenbosch and Cape Town, and we decided, okay, let's do this little thing, Paul, Stellenbosch, someone said, where's that little stretch that I showed you right initially? And you know what? We can actually still differentiate these plots according to where they actually come from. Yeah, Rust is on to something now. They said to me, we collect here. Sometimes we get scared because we don't have the permits to collect. So don't worry, guys. We will apply for permits, and then you can collect as much of this material as you would like. And this magic plant is in this packet. Yep. And the longer it hangs around, the more toxic it becomes. 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015, 2016 was really, really hot and very, very potent. So we have to standardize somehow. So we decided, okay, all of these chemotherapies that are out in the market, it's a single actin compound, a combination of things, but there's nothing there that is actually a herbal product. And we think that we can use our extract together with the chemotherapy, so uh, uh, together, because the extract still provides you with some kind of health. So we tested these things together. We tested the alcoholic extract as well as the docs. And yes, it works. But the extract alone is still much more effective. Yeah? What was also interesting is that the bush doctors don't really like to drink alcohol. They're rasters. They make a tea. And so we tested the water extract, and that water extract is just as effective. Those guys really do know their stuff. Yeah? And so we can utilize a suite of different scientific systems to firstly corroborate um, indigenous uh, knowledge and actually add a new value to it because some people don't believe it when you say, I think this works, I pick it up from Stellenbosch Mountain. You actually have to provide that empirical evidence that yes, it does work. And so we assist with this as well. So how do we um, protect these plants that are overexploited, various different ways, and cultivation is one of them. And this particular project that I've been talking about, of this magic plant that the bush doctors have actually got, you can take a taste. It should be soapy when you taste it, and a little bit bitter. Um, it's not really going to be... Um, um, exploited to extinction because it's actually the leaves that we actually use. But a lot of um, plant material might be growing in as small pockets, small populations that are very fragile. Or some of these plants might actually be growing um, as bulbous material, such as, the, as these pelargoniums that I'm actually going to pass around. So people use pelargonium, but they use the bulb. And so this creates a conservation issue, which we then deal with 
by utilizing uh, cultivation as a system to conserve. And at this time, I know people are starting to get a little bit tired. Yeah, so this is a time when I say, okay, if you feel your energy is getting a little bit low, then you can maybe try some of this Bushman's ecstasy. Um, it makes you feel happy. And you can smoke it, sniff it, make a tincture, do all kinds of things with it. Um, put it on your, chew it, put it on your tongue, it gets absorbed into your bloodstream right onto the brain and then the euphoria comes, yeah? So you can try it, skeletium. It is actually being commercialized to treat a variety of different things, including depression, um, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, ADHD. I have another student that needs it to write up an MSc thesis. Um, so you can try it if you would like. I would like the bag back at the end of the day. And this particular plant um, grows in the Karoo, in the succulent Karoo. It comes um, from very sparse populations, and we think that there might ultimately be a conservation issue here. Because if you put skeletium, and you send that out to Google, you get a lot of hits and all kinds of weird and wonderful things. And this has really exploded um, since people regard this as a way of feeling happy. And the happiness comes from the suite of chemicals, mesembrine alkaloids, and solely synthesized by the skeletium genus. So it's pretty special. It's a mesem. I'm not going to try and say uh, that family name because it's very long. But it's got these beautiful yellow flowers. And it is commercially available. A variety of different things that will say skeletium tea. And usually that's got this much rooibos, this much honeybush, and this much skeletium. Okay, anyway, so what we've been doing is really trying to understand what does this particular plant really need to grow? Because we need to farm it, and some people are farming it. So again, we collect in very diff different places, Oatswan, Karlistorp, Montague. Sometimes I get to go to really nice, cool places because of research. And what's really interesting is that this mesembrine is produced at very high levels by those plants in Oatsworn. And I'm not going to tell you where they are exactly. <laughs> because the guys that like to go to Africa burn, this is one of their favorite things to take with them. Because it makes them have a really wonderful Africa burn. Or so they claim. Um, so, we are trying to understand the chemistry of these populations so that we can take that chemistry and be able to exploit it so that we're no longer reliant on the natural system. And the work we did with this, this looks at like a very scary kind of graph. That's why I think if you've got the bag of skeletium, maybe take a little bit so you can concentrate on this thing. So, we go and collect soil samples, all these things that are actually in blue. These are um, chemicals in the soil which we've analyzed from these three different populations. And what's really wonderful is that these metabolites, actually in red, you don't really need to see and read that thing, are actually correlated to the soil chemistry. So the soil chemistry influences the levels of the mesembrines. So what does Knox think? I now know what's in the soil. I can take this information and provide it to people that are farming skeletium and say, if you provide a composition of this, 
in terms of your soil chemistry, you will be able to have high levels of mesembrine or low levels of mesembrine null. And we are also able to use that information because we grow these plants in a tissue culture system and even as cell cultures. And we are hoping that we can take this particular system, the system of growing it in a cell culture, and grow these large masses of cells in an industrial reactor, similarly to how they made all those wonderful beers that people have been drinking this, after, this evening. And this will lead us to a strategy that is conservation sensitive and allow us to preserve the biodiversity which is actually pretty precious um, when we look at the population uh, structure of skeletium. Okay. And what's wonderful is that soup of stuff, that soup of cells, still creates all of that chemistry. And that's pretty unusual because when plants are grown as single cell cultures, they lose the chemistry because they don't have all of their different organs. So it's wonderful that we are able to manufacture these chemicals so that we can provide them to various different industries without harming the natural populations. Okay? And so, just to look at this, to convince you guys, when we measure the chemistry, we can actually create an interesting suite of chemotypes that are high producers of these mesembrine alkaloids. And this is significant because the levels of mesembrine, mesembrinol, mesembrinone determines the effectiveness. And one of the growers in Somerset West, he said, I've got plants and I can make an extract that puts mommy, puts the baby to sleep. Yeah, so nice and calming and calming for the baby, relaxing, but can also comatose the mother-in-law. <laughs> so I thought that was really, really quite interesting. And I said to this guy, I said, well, we haven't quite gotten to those particular chemotypes that can put the mother-in-law uh, in a... Um, severely um, sensitive state. Um, but this guy, a few years later, actually is manufacturing some of his skeletum, and it is actually available as a product. And he has been able to create some uh, jobs for um, people that are associated with his particular business. Okay, so... I'm not sure how I'm doing with time, but I think I'm probably almost there. And I'd just like to synthesize this very quickly in a few take-home messages. And I think, I hope I've left you with one impression this evening, that indigenous knowledge is very important because it actually leads us to new discoveries about our plants, which actually are very, very, very interesting, and we hardly even understand their chemistry. And it really is a huge ask, because there are many of these plants in South Africa that are used for a variety of different um, purposes, including things like wild garlic. And if you smell this lot, I think it kind of does have a bit of a garlicky smell. And it is wonderful if you have a fungal infection because it's extremely potent. So this indigenous knowledge really, really is of great relevance and we need to actually hold it in high, um, in high esteem. And I hope I've also been able to convince you that we can use all kinds of sophisticated technologies. And this adds a new value to indigenous knowledge and also is able to add a new value 
to our local flora, which is also very understudied. And I think this is quite important because if you take a plant like Devil's Claw, Hypogophytum procumbens, this is the very first species that entered into the European pharmacopoeia. And this is probably one of Germany's most important medicinal herbs. And what happens with this is that it's collected in Southern Africa, it's taken out raw, the Germans manufacture wonderful preparations with it, they derive all the benefits because they are the ones that added value to this by studying the chemistry, creating all sorts of new um, chemotypes, etc. And then when we buy back this information and get back these um, products, they actually come back to us much more expensive. And I feel that it is high time that the scientists in countries where the biodiversity is high take the mandate of utilizing this natural resource in order to be able to build new economies and also to create a new knowledge which is not only locally relevant, but relevant to the rest of the world. So that the people that have held on to this knowledge for thousands of years are also able to derive benefits. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank you for your attention. I don't do this just by myself. I do it with a whole bunch of people, and I'd like to thank them as well.